Right, let's get started. Thanks for coming. All right, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, just to make sure the remote people can, can, can you hear me? Can you just confirm that you exist? Yeah, sounds good. Yep. All right, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so welcome to the talk. I'm going to talk about neural software analysis, which is um, another way of learning development tools by um, basically learning them from, from code. Um, maybe as a motivation, let's start with um, by zooming out a little bit and, and, and thinking about why we humans are what we are today. And I think one of the key abilities that we have as humans is this ability to develop tools. So we started very early with these uh, sort of Stone Age level tools, have built these impressive industrial um, things that help us shape the world. But nowadays, everything is about software. So what, what, what matters a lot nowadays are software development tools. So things like compilers, bug detection tools, uh, code completion tools, and many other tools that software developers are using to be productive. So an important question is how we actually create these tools. And the traditional answer um, that everybody was giving us a few years ago was to use program analysis. Um, so someone, or usually not just one person, but many people sit down um, for a couple of years and then manually craft some analysis. Um, for example, the, the infer tool by Facebook, which is a bug detection tool, was developed by tens of people over a couple of years. And now at the end, they have a tool that finds a particular class of bugs and, and does that pretty well. Um, so these tools are based on precise logical reasoning. But of course, precise logical reasoning alone is not enough to answer interesting questions in program analysis, because almost all interesting questions uh, are undecidable. So on top of this precise and logical reasoning, you typically also need a set of heuristics to make a tool really, uh, really useful. And finally, another property of the traditional program analysis um, techniques is that they are usually challenged by larger code bases. So as, as soon as the code gets larger and more complex, um, things become more challenging um, because it's, it's, it's non-trivial to scale these analyses. Now, on the other hand, um, you can also build a developer tool um, by learning from, uh, from existing software. And this is what we call neural software analysis. So here, um, the analysis is automatically learned within a few hours from data. This doesn't count the time that you need to actually build the, 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 the model to, to learn the analysis, but once you have this, you can, you can relearn it um, within a few hours. And instead of precise logical reasoning, it's based on data-driven uh, prediction. So it's learning from data um, what you want to um, yeah, maybe provide as a tool. Um, of course, it's also based on heuristics, but the good news is that these heuristics are not hard coded by anyone, but they are um, implicitly learned. So uh, yes, there are heuristics, but you do not have to really encode them, um, but, but you can just learn them from, from data. And maybe the coolest property of it is that um, instead of seeing large code bases as a problem, they become part of the, of the solution because you, you basically simply learn from them. And the more code you have, the, the better it is because then you can learn even more. Um, so based on this um, idea of neural software analysis and this insight that there's a lot of data about software development, um, many of the techniques in this space basically fit this, this bigger picture here, where somewhere in the middle you have a machine learning model, um, typically a neural model, but it could also be something else. The input to this is either a lot of source code or execution traces or other artifacts that are associated with software like documentation or maybe bug reports. And then you use this data to train the model that at the end gives you some predictive tool, which once you have trained it, um, can look at new code that it hasn't seen before or new exec uh, executions, and then predict some information that is hopefully useful for developers, such as bugs or, or other things, and uh, I give concrete examples um, in the talk. Um, feel free to ask questions on the way, so please don't wait until the end. So if you want to ask anything, just, uh, just let me know. So in this talk, I want to um, give two examples of neural software analysis that we've been recently working on. Um, the first one is called Malin, and that's a technique to find main value inconsistencies. We'll see in a second what exactly that is. And then the second one is called Typewriter. That was work done um, when I was spending a sabbatical in Facebook, which is about uh, type prediction. So it takes code written in an untyped um, or partially typed language and then predicts more type annotations to be added to this code. Um, the papers on all of this, so if you want to know more details, uh, feel free to, to check those out. So let's look at the first um, uh, piece of work, this uh, technique to detect uh, name value inconsistencies. And I'd like to kick this off with a little example where something is wrong. And um, maybe if you stare a bit at this code, you can guess what is, what is wrong here. 
just let me look at this for a few seconds. I can go if that helps. <laughs> Exactly. That's it. Um, yeah. So because you you probably have an integer here, but then you multiply it with zero point nine, and that means uh, train size will be a float. Um, but later on, it's used down here uh, to slice this uh, data array, or maybe it's a tensor. Um, but you're not allowed to to, to use uh, floats for slicing, and therefore the code will crash at a at a at a third line um, because the the value doesn't really um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, well, it's not the one that you would expect. Um, another example is this one. So in, in that second example, everything is correct from a, from a just functional point of view, but um, there's a problem um, if, you, if, if you're interested in the usability or extendability or, or maintainability of this code, which is that um, this OS path exists, checks whether some file exists, then stores the result, which is a Boolean, into this variable called file. And file is maybe not the best name for, for the result of a Boolean check because usually file refers to either some file pointer or maybe the name of a, of a file. Um, so um, the problem here is that we have a misleading name because um, yeah, file doesn't, just doesn't sound like a Boolean. And what these two examples have in common is that um, there is an inconsistency between a value and the name that refers to this value, which in the first case leads to just incorrect behavior. And in the second case, Makes it hard to understand and maintain the code. So now the goal of um, of our approach is to find such name value inconsistencies, and to do this, there are a couple of challenges we need to address. Where the first one is to understand the meaning of names. So as a as a human, if I show you some code, you get an idea what this code um, means because you have an understanding of the meaning of the identifier names that are used in there. But a typical program analysis cannot really do this because they, I mean, the first thing most program analysis do is to throw away the names because they don't matter really for the runtime semantics, but actually they are pretty useful. The second challenge um, is to understand the meaning of values. So if you see some runtime value in some representation, you typically get an understanding of what, what this means. But again, um, having this kind of understanding in a program analysis is tricky. And then once we have addressed these first two challenges, the third one is to precisely pinpoint unusual combinations of names and values um, where we want to be precise um, so that we do not overwhelm developers with um, um, false positives, but at the same time, try to find as many of these interesting um, inconsistencies as possible. So here's how we do this. Um, so the technique, as many techniques in this space, consists of a training phase and a prediction phase. The input to both of them are executable programs. So we, we do not just look at code as most existing techniques in that space, but actually look at executing code. And then um, apply a dynamic analysis that looks at all assignments in the program. So basically all places where a value is bound to some name. And the, the assumption is that all or almost all of the assignments that we observe during the execution of these programs <coughs> are, are good examples or positive examples. Um, but because we want to generate, uh, because we want to train um, a classifier that distinguishes between uh, consistent and inconsistent name value pairs, we also need negative examples. So we have this step here that is generating negative examples based on the examples that we have observed during um, the executions. And then once we have these two sets of examples, the positive ones and the negative ones, we train a neural model, which is just a binary classifier to distinguish between the two. Um, and then we can use this neural model um, in the prediction phase to reason about new executions of programs that we have not seen before and hopefully find some interesting name value inconsistencies in them. Um, so let's go through these um, green boxes one by one. Let's start with the um, analysis of assignments. So the first option we have considered is a static analysis. So life would be much easier if you wouldn't have to execute the code. Um, but the problem is that, uh, at least in the data set that we look at, and probably also in most other code, the, the large majority of assignments have a complex expression on the right hand side. So we basically don't really know what exactly the value is that is assigned to 
um, to a name. So in these two um, examples that you've already seen, um, we would, for the second one, for example, have to have some model of what uh, os.path.exists returns in order to understand that um, the value might be true or false. Um, and similarly here, we would have to have an idea of what is in this shape um, field of, of this object, but statically, it's, it's relatively hard to, to do this. So instead of static analysis, um, we went for a dynamic analysis, uh, which is based on source-to-source -source instrumentation. So this is implemented for Python, meaning we take some Python program and then instrument all the assignments that are in the program. So that when the program is executed, we extract um, five properties for every assignment. The first one is the, the name that is assigned to, so just the name of the left-hand side, for example, the variable name. The second one is a string representation of the value that is, that is written. Um, the reason why we use string representations here is because they are commonly used by developers and typically um, encode interesting properties of, of the value itself and at the same time are relatively short, making it um, yeah, feasible to reason about them. Um, then we also extract the type of every value because it turns out that types are really um, important for this kind of uh, analysis. And finally, we also have the length of the value and the shape of the value, where length, for example, tells us whether um, um, yeah, a string is empty or not empty, or whether an array is empty or not empty. And shape is because in Python, there's a lot of code that manipulates some kind of um, higher dimensional numerical data structure like a tensor, um, and the shape tells us how this tensor looks. So here's um, just an example of a few um, of the properties that we, that we would expect during an execution. So the first column is the name of some variable that it's written to, and the second column is the string representation of the value, then the type, um, and then the length and, and the shape. Um, as you can see, um, if we do not know what the length or shape is, maybe because this kind of value just doesn't have a shape, we just put null, so we just ignore this, um, this kind of property. Um, there's one unusual example in here, so you can already spot it um, very good. Otherwise, I'll get back to it um, a little bit later. Good. So now, um, this is how we get the positive examples. Um, the next challenge is to uh, create negative examples that allow us to um, yeah, eventually train this classifier to distinguish between the likely consistent and likely inconsistent name value pairs. So the naive approach, which we have try first is to just randomly combine names and values that we have seen um, in our data set. So let's, for example, assume that our positive example, um, or that we have two positive examples uh, that you see here. So one is the value 23 written into the name num, the other one is three written into the name h. Then you would just randomly recombine them and create these two supposedly negative examples. But now the problem is um, what you see in this example, namely that we find uh, that, that we get a lot of legitimate negative examples, which are not really problematic, but just just different from what we have observed in the in the data gathering, um, which eventually means we have a, a pretty noisy training data set, and this means that we will get get a model that reports many false positives. So we should not do that, and instead um, went for a type guided generation of negative examples which um, is based on, on two steps. So the first one is that we um, look at a name that we, that we have observed during one of the executions and then select a type that is unusual for this particular name. And at the same time, common across all the observed values that we've seen during the analyzed executions. So the reason for the, for the first bit, the unusual for this name is that we um, want to have a negative example that is likely to be an inconsistency. So it should be something that doesn't really happen um, in, in, in practice very often. And the reason for the second one that, that the type should be common across all the observed values is that we um, do not want to make it too easy for the model to find it. So if you would just take um, very unlikely types that the model would learn to say, okay, these unlikely types, they're probably an inconsistency, but that doesn't really help us later on to find real inconsistencies. And then once we have found this type, um, we pick a random value of this type um, by, by basically just going through all the values that we have observed for this type and, um, and, and selecting it. So let's have a look at an example. 
Um, so let's say we have observed this assignment of this array of two numbers to a variable called years. So that's our positive example. Then we first look at all the types that are um, associated with this uh, name here, so that we ever have seen with this name years. And in this example, let's say we have seen a lot of lists, um, also quite a few MD arrays, but like only a few flows, a few dicts, and maybe a long, long tail of other types that we have never seen or only very, very infrequently seen um, with this name years. So we ignore those that are that are more on the left here, that are, that are common for this name, but only focus on those that are um, unusual for this name, or maybe never even been observed for this name. And then for those types, we look at the uh, global distribution, so the global frequencies that these types have. Um, so for example, we see that um, there are a lot of strings, but we've never seen a string that is um, assigned to a variable called years. And then we um, sample from this global frequency, or from this distribution, um, a type. Um, let's say for the sake of the example, we sample a bool and, and then pick a random value of this type, so for example, false, and then this gives a negative example um, by, by saying that false and years is, is likely uh, an inconsistency. Right, so this um, gives us now the positive and negative examples. Uh, let's next have a look at the um, and the actual uh, neural model that, that, that is in this uh, in this whole technique. So we have um, these five properties, the name, the value, the type, the length, and shape of each value. And at the end, what we want to get is a prediction of the probability that this combination of a name and the value is, uh, is inconsistent. So for the positive example, um, this should ideally be zero. And for the net negative example, this should ideally be uh, predicted to be wrong. And now to, to get there, we need to um, represent all of these properties as a vector and then feed this into, into, into a model that, that, um, that classifies um, this name value combination. So for the names, um, we build on a, on a pre trained uh, embedding based on fast text, which is yeah, a technique originally developed for natural language processing to embed individual words into, into a vector space so that similar words will get a, a similar vector representation. Um, for the value, or more precisely, the, the string representation of the value, um, we feed it into uh, a GRU based uh, recurrent neural network and also into uh, convolutional neural networks, and then just concatenate the two vector representations we get out of this. And for the type, the length, and the shape, we um, have a one hot encoding, so basically a vector with all zeros and one element set to one that tells us, for example, what type um, this, this value is. And then all of these vectors are concatenated, given to a few feed forward layers. And then at the end, the model predicts one number, which is um, this probability that um, this pair is, is inconsistent. All right, so let's have a look at um, the evaluation. Um, so we um, need some programs that we can execute. Actually, we need many programs that we can execute. and. In Python, um, one good way of getting a, a large set of executable programs uh, are Jupyter notebooks. I and mean, that's something that um, many people use nowadays anyway to, to write Python code. And many of these notebooks contain all their inputs. So we do not have to worry about um, and generating inputs to run these programs. So we started with a data set of a million of these Jupyter notebooks um, that was compiled by some other people. Um, many of them could not really be executed, um, for example, because of missing dependencies. But um, removing all of those that we failed to execute, um, we still had about 100,000 of these notebooks, out of which we got roughly 950,000 of these main value pairs. So it's a relatively large data set um, to, um, to reason about. All right, so given this data set, we now train the classifier. And what you can see here is the uh, precision and the recall and the F1 score of, um, of the classifier, depending on the threshold we use for reporting the warnings. So just remember that the model predicts this probability that a pair is inconsistent. And now we can set a threshold starting from which we actually report a pair as a warning to a developer. If you set the threshold higher, we will find fewer of the, the actual inconsistencies. So the recall goes down, but the precision goes up because the model is more certain that it's actually appropriate. Um, 
Now, a good threshold is somewhere in the middle, and the, the best F1 score uh, we got here was 89%, meaning that the model finds most of the inconsistencies and is correct most of the time when it says that it's, it's, what, what is that one score? It's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. It's just a, okay. a, a common way to combine uh, precision, okay. precision and recall. So this is you're evaluating again on your on a pull out test set, or this is on the whole corpus? This, this, this is on a on a whole test set. Test set yeah. So and so as what do you what is your ground truth? So so for this experiment, good question. Yeah, for this experiment, the ground truth is um, our label that we have generated. So, so the positive examples are all those that we have observed. The negative are those mm -hmm. that we generate. So so in a sense, this is a synthetic data set. Um, because the negative examples are, are generated. Um, but as you'll see in the next slide, we'll also have experiments where we um, want to not do this. But for a larger scale evaluation, we really need to use these uh, generated labels because otherwise you, you just don't have enough labels. To what degree have you vetted the synthetic negative examples? Because I feel like English um, is a very rich language. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, I think it'd be very easy to have things like, well, of course these are unrelated and it's a totally different type. But then it turns out like these are great. Mm -hmm. so it's a great representation. Of this right, right, right. Um, we look quite a bit at them, and, and that's also why we discarded this naive approach. Yeah, naive is clearly really bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, initially we thought it's it's maybe really good enough, but yeah, we, <laughs> okay. we always find out afterwards. Um, yeah. Um, so, but, but, so, so we looked a lot at negative examples, but even more at the warnings that you eventually get in, uh -huh. in, in real code, and that gives you a feel for what is good or bad about the negative examples you're generating. Yeah. So, would you say from this approach, I'm getting the vibe that like. Okay, it's not reporting every incongruity, but the ones it does, you agree, like, yeah, this is bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the better okay. that's Good. Better. One more thing. How is precision in recall defined? Is that the probability that the it's actually true or false given your reporting, or is it the other way around? The probability that you report it true or false given it's actually true or false? Mm, one, I mean, each of them is one. So, so, so precision is, is the probability that if a warning is reported, it's actually a negative example. And recall is the percentage of all negative examples that we find. Okay. All right, so this is um, yeah, just looking at a classifier based on the synthetic examples, but we were also wondering to what extent um, the warnings that Nalin produces not only uh, match our understanding of names and values, but also that of other developers, uh, which is why we did a study with uh, a few developers. But we basically showed them um, pairs of names and values and then asked them to, to assess whether this is an easy to understand combination or a hard to understand combination. So basically, if you would see this pair somewhere in the program, um, would it make it easy or hard to understand the program? Now, what you see here um, is um, on one hand, um, what the developers thought, um, and on the other hand, whether Naden, our tool, predicted a pair to be consistent or inconsistent. And uh, fortunately, it turns out that most of the time the developers find it they to be easy to understand. It's uh, also classified as consistent by, by Nadine, whereas if developers find it hard to understand, it's classified as inconsistent by Nadine. So it's not a perfect match, but um, overall, um, it, it's a precision of 80% and a recall of uh, 76%. Um, so not always, but most of the time, Nadine actually matches what, what uh, yeah, developers also feel about a particular name by your communication. So there's a subtle mismatch here in that in a developer will rarely get to see a name value pair, but typically gets to see a name expression pair. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. But, but, but I think it's still, that's true. That's true. And, I mean, unless you're debugging or printing some values. Right, right, right. 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 Um, but, but usually when you look at code, you, you look at the names and then you want to get some understanding of what the values might be. Sure. If, 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 if I tell you, hey, this value is assigned to that name and, 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 and you think, well, but they don't match, <laughs> then it, right. it's a problem. That, right. That's basically what we try to right. do. I agree, certainly, certainly post hoc, right? If they're debugging a program that they know isn't working, then they'll definitely, uh, they'll get to see the values and they'll see the mismatch. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it would take to close the loop there in terms of like connecting that with why a name doesn't match with an expression, which is in, like for, for yeah. some of these, like that's the core issue. Like for your second example, where they called file the result of this OS stuff, but it's mm -hmm. just like that's gonna that's not gonna mess up the developer who wrote it. That's gonna mess up the developer maintaining it. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah. it's just like 
And there, sort of like, is file, should the file be a Boolean? Probably not, but like, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. it's a flag. So, so I, I wonder what, what closing, what loop would look like. Mm -hmm. So basically how to, how to, what would closing a loop mean exactly? So, so how, how to show these problems to developers? Yeah, I mean, so to me, sort of like, Maybe maybe it's maybe it doesn't matter because your tool is going to show them the line number which gets them to the expression. Mm -hmm. I guess this exper this this experiment is validating the the value mismatch part, and then whether or not Nayland does a good job in practice is what evaluates whether that connects to the expressions that generate the values. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe it's not a good deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the next experiment is a little bit of what you what you what you mean. So basically, what yeah, we did here yeah, yeah, was yeah. to to look at some of the warnings that they then um, reports and, and then we, we manually labeled them as either, hey, this is a misleading name. So probably the, the behavior is correct, but it's misleading if you want to understand the code or it's just a completely <coughs> incorrect value um, or it's a false positive, which of course I really do not want, want to have, but of course that also happens. Um, so let me just give you examples for each of these three kinds. So here's an example of a misleading name which um, is about a variable called main, um, which at some point in the program actually contains a main, but then later on contains this uh, load 2.5, which is a pretty unusual combination and, and probably uh, should be written like this. Um, another example is uh, an incorrect value where someone has this variable called prop, which is supposed to mean probability, uh, but for some reason, this function returns a string value um, which is clearly not a probability. And then later on is uh, compared to, to, to one half and uh, this check actually fails or crashes uh, because you can't really compare a string and one half using uh, quite a bit. And finally, example of a uh, false positive. So here um, we have this variable called uh, dwarf where the um, probably stands for file. Um, and it makes some sense because the, the, the value is actually a path that points to some file, um, but our model didn't really understand this abbreviation. It didn't really get that F is supposed to be file, and therefore reported this as a as an inconsistency. But arguably, it's okay if you if you like short variable names, then it's in the Cool. Um, yeah, we also compared Nalin with uh, a couple of existing tools. So there isn't really a tool that does exactly what what Nalin is trying to do. So we looked around for tools that are that are trying to do similar things. And we ended up comparing um, to two traditional um, static checkers. One of them is uh, Pyre, um, um, yeah, a gradual type checker from Python. And the other one is Flake 8, which looks for lots of style related issues. So it's a lint like tool that is, that is pretty popular. Um, and then we also compared to Deepbox, which is our own prior work. Um, it's also a learning based bug detector, but static. And it also looks at name related problems. So, so we thought it's maybe a good point of comparison. And then we compared them by basically running these three tools on the 30 files that contained the warnings from the previous slide. And by checking um, how many of the warnings that those tools find are shared with Maybe. And what you find is that there's very, very little overlap. I mean, there's exactly one, one problem that is um, found by Nalin and one of the existing tools, which was this, uh, this variable name um, from, from one or two slides ago that um, also Pyre finds because it also turns out to be a type issue. Um, but for all the other problems, um, the existing tools do not find them, uh, meaning that um, yeah, the existing approaches and Nalin are complementary. Good, so let me just summarize this first part, um, which is about yeah, this tool called Nalin to detect um, name value inconsistencies. Uh, in contrast to most of the existing work in this neural software analysis space, um, it's uh, learning from runtime behavior and not just from code. And uh, as a technical contribution, we have this uh, type guided generation of negative examples, which I think could also be useful in, uh, in similar approaches where you basically want to um, create a lot of negative examples and need some way to create them. Any more questions on? On this one before I, I have two yeah. small ones about uh -huh. about this about setting sort of so you're using Jupyter notebooks as your basis. Yeah. Is there kind of um I worry about a crappiness bias, mm. right? Like a lot of Jupyter notebooks are maybe people learning Python or yeah, somebody yeah. it's like a throwaway thing. Right. Um 
would it be different if you had taken code bases like that were like mature Python code bases like PyTorch and mm -hmm. Django and sort of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. Uh, we don't know the reason why we chose Jupyter notebooks is it's because it's relatively easy to execute many of them. Uh, Whereas yeah. for, for 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 any other Python project, you basically I mean you can for example get the the the, the unit tests to run. It's Maybe. a little different for every project, so it's pretty yeah. tedious to get a data set of that size. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it would be, it would be interesting future work to apply this to, to other projects. Yeah. My other question is more open, sort of, uh, the, 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 the lineup with Pyre sort of makes it clear, like one main, like main value inconsistencies that are semantic could lead to type errors. Mm -hmm. And so then, and you're clearly using a bunch of type information, uh, but you're also doing interesting stuff with dynamic stuff. So what would you do differently if you were doing this for a type language? Hmm, good, good question. Um, I think some of the inconsistencies just don't exist in the type language because the type, system, updates, yeah. the, the, the type system just um, just catches them and, and, and tells you about them. But there are probably also other interesting kinds of inconsistencies in the type language. So let's say you have a, a very called prop for probability. Um, then what you want is that it should be a float that is between zero and, and one, right? It should not be minus 3.5. Mm. Um, and this kind of inconsistency you, you could also find in a, in a type language. I mean, also in Python, right? Of course, also in Python. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but so, so I think that the, the, the set of problems are, are, are smaller, is, is smaller in, in a type language, but then you may be able to find it more, more subtle problems. All right, cool. Then um, after this first example of a new road software analysis, um, let me move on to a second one. So we already talked a lot about types and, uh, and the fact that having types in a language might actually be useful for, for preventing these kinds of inconsistencies. And that's exactly the problem we're addressing in the second piece of work where we try to add types um, to a dynamically typed uh, language. So why do we need to do this? Um, I guess one of the main reasons is that these dynamically typed languages are super popular. Um, everybody's writing JavaScript and Python and so on these days. Um, but of course, these languages do not come with type annotations um, by default, which means you may have type errors. Um, it's, it's much harder than necessary to understand an API because you just don't know how to call it and what it will return. Um, and it also leads to pretty poor IDE support because a lot of the IDE support is based on types. But if you don't have them, um, yeah, that's a problem. Um, fortunately, there's this idea of radial typing, which you know very well, um, which allows you to add some type annotations to a program and then check um, if they are consistent with each other without requiring you to, to really add types everywhere. But um, annotating an existing code base with types is, um, is really painful. Um, so this work was motivated by, um, by me being at Facebook and, and seeing the huge um, um, code base in, in Python, which had very little type annotations, um, which they wanted to have, but nobody was really willing to, to sit down days and weeks to, to add types to code written a couple of years ago. So the question is how to add these type annotations. And there are basically three options. Um, one is static type inference, which is great, but um, a, a bit limited in practice, because it basically tries to be sound and guarantee that every type you add um, leads to a type correct program and because it's doing this um, there are many places at least in Python where it just cannot really make any any useful prediction. Um, another option is dynamic type inference. So you run the program, observe the types of some values and then take those as annotations. Um, the two issues, one is of course coverage. So it's difficult to run all the code. And the other one is that the uh, types you observe often are too precise. Um, and uh, if you add them, um, they, they will not um, be valid in, in the general case. And then the third option, which is what we do here, um, is probabilistic type prediction. So you learn some kind of model um, from already existing type annotations that predicts missing type annotations. And, and this is the, the, the route that um, we've taken here. So this idea of probabilistic type prediction is not new in, 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 the, in the work that I'm presenting here. So there have been some the prior approaches, including some by, by us, um, that basically all follow this, this, this larger pattern. So there's some neural model, and it's reasons about the code based on identifier names, other natural language information, such as comments, and of course the code itself, for example, by looking at the sequence of, of tokens or maybe some richer representation. And then this neural model learns to predict type annotations um, after having been trained on a code that has already been annotated. 
So now, if you take this kind of approach, whether right, one of the existing ones or the one I'm talking about here, um, you run into two, two uh, big challenges. One um, is imprecision. So because this is a probabilistic model, some of the predictions are wrong. And so the assumption so far has been that, okay, some developer will look at these predictions and then decide which of the predicted types to actually add. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not really, um, yeah, maybe you're not in automating this task of annotating um, yeah, thousands of lines of code if you, if you have to manually decide for every type which one you, you want to have. And the problem gets worse. And that's the second challenge. If you want to do this for, for a large code base where you have not just one missing type, but many of them. And for each of them, you have one or more suggestions what type to add. And now you need to reason about all the combinations of the types that you could add, which in practice gives many more combinations that you can really um, consider um, as, a, as a human. But to make this a little bit more concrete, let's have a look at um, an example. So this is uh, a bit of Python code to functions. And let's suppose we would like to um, add uh, annotations for the parameters and the, the return values of these of these functions. And let's suppose we have some existing probabilistic type prediction technique that gives us for every parameter and every return value a list of the most likely types. So for example, for this color parameter, it might suggest that um, well, most likely it's an int or maybe it's a string or maybe it's a word. And likewise for the return value, it might suggest some types and also for the return value of the, of the third function. But now the problem is if you just take the topmost predictions, which, um, um, which one might naively do, then these three types together actually lead to a type error um, because they are not consistent with each other and basically give you um, an incorrectly typed program. And instead for this example, what we need is the, the second most likely type for the parameter and the second most likely type also for the return value of the first function and the most likely type for the return value of the, of the second function. And only then you get um, a type correct program. So now in order to find this kind of um, type assignment automatically, um, we have this typewriter approach, which consists of two main steps. So the first step is um, a probabilistic type prediction model that applies a very lightweight static analysis to, to code, extracts some natural language information and also some programming language information, and then trains a, a neural type prediction model. And then given these type predictions, which is essentially this list of the most likely types for every place where a type is missing, um, we have a, a search for a set of consistent types which uses um, the fact that we have these existing static type checkers um, as, as an oracle to check if a particular type assignment makes sense. And then also has a, has a feedback directed search where we try to um, step-by-step -step refine the types that we are assigning until we reach um, a set of types that are type correct according to the type checker. And then what typewriter as a whole does is to um, produce a program, the program, but with added type annotations while guaranteeing that all the types that are added um, um, uh, are still type correct. So you never get a type error because of the types that um, type right has. All right, so let's go through these uh, boxes um, step by step. And let's start with the kind of information that we are using to, to make these predictions. Um, so we use two kinds of information, natural language, because that turns out to be really useful to, to predict uh, types. In particular, we look at the names of the functions and the names of the arguments. And you also look um, at function level comments if, if those are available. And then on the, on the programming language side, um, we look at all the occurrences of the code element that we would like to annotate. So for example, if you want to add the type of a parameter, we look at all the users of this parameter um, in, in the function. And we also look at uh, the types that are already made available for imports, because in Python, you often have to import a type before you can use it. Um, and this gives us a hint what types might be the most relevant in the particular program. So looking back, back at the example, um, for example, we would extract the names of, um, of this parameter and of the function itself. Um, we would also extract this, um, the stock string that we have here. And um, finally, we would also look at um, on the PL side, 
get the tokens around the element that we want to type. So for example, the tokens just before and after this occurrence of the of the color parameter, and likewise um, for the for the return uh, statements. All right, and then once we have all this information, um, we um, represent it in a way that allows us to reason about it in a, in a neural model. So for code tokens, um, we use a pre trained uh, token embedding that basically maps every token into a vector representation and then summarize a sequence of tokens um, using a recurrent neural network, which then gives us one vector that represents this entire sequence. And for identifiers and comments, we do more or less the same, but now based on a pre trained word embedding that is pre trained on a natural language. Um, again, giving us um, one vector um, for the identifiers or and, and another one for the comments. Um, we also have this set of available types that we basically encode as a, as a one hot vector, that you can think of as a type mask. So basically, everything is zero except the types that have been imported in the file. How do you encode higher order types? Like um, I saw in previous, like a list of string. Like, do you just enumerate, like, say, list of string, list of any, list of list of string? Yeah, like okay. some sort of depth? Good, good, good question. So, what we do here is to basically just enumerate. So, we have a fixed type vocabulary, uh, which is the top 1,000 types across the entire corpus that we have. Um, and then, if there's a list of string and a list of int, um, and, and both are common, they are part of the vocabulary. So, like, you're Tool probably would not infer like list of list of list of string or anything bizarre like that. It would just give list I, I, unless it's in the top one thousand. But but if it's if it's very bizarre, then then, then we cannot infer it. Right. Good point. Yeah, I mean that's a that would be a nice line of future work to find a, a better way to represent these these uh, um, yeah parametric types. Um, because you, yeah, I mean, a list of string and a list of uh, ins, of course, has, has something in common which we currently don't really really encode here. Right, so then, so given these um, these vector representations of these of these different ingredients, uh, we again just put everything into into one big vector, um, feed it through um, a hidden layer, and then at the end we have a softmax function that basically outputs a probability distribution over our type vocabulary. So it's um, for these one thousand types um, gives us a vector that tells us what is the probability that this type or that type or that type is the right type. Um, for the code element that we want to, uh, want to type. So that's the neural model. Um, now this gives us this uh, list of top k predictions for every missing type in the in the program. But now the challenge is to pick the right type um, from this list and to do this so that at the end we have a consistent type assignment across the entire program. Um, so to do this, um, we filter these predictions based on a gradient type checker. Um, there, there are quite a few of those by now. For Python, there's Pyre and MyPy. Um, and for Java, JavaScript, there's, for example, Flow. Um, here, we're using Pyre um, um, for Python. But in principle, you could do the same with any, with any other one. Um, now, doing this for different parts of the program where a type is missing um, leads to this combinatorial uh, search problem where um, for a given set of type slots, so basically missing types, S, and K predictions per slot, um, you have K plus one to the power of the size of S um, possible type assignments, um, which turns out to be um, yeah just a number that is too large to explore exhaustively. So we need some more clever way to, to, to explore the right type assignments um, first so that we quickly find um, and and the way to do this, or the way we do this, is to think about um, the search space as a tree of variants of the original program. So the, the root of this tree is the program with the originally given types, um, which might be none or might be some if the, if the code is already partially annotated. And then every edge corresponds to adding or removing or replacing some types, um, which gives us new variants of this program. The question is, um, which of these Pass through this tree to um, to explore first, so that we quickly find a good type assignment without having to explore the entire search space. Did you, did you try or consider the compora approach, the chin trans variational stuff? Mm, what's that? Uh, let's talk about it later. There's another, there's, okay. a, there's another cool way of doing this. Okay, okay, okay. Well, it's like you need to do, you, you type check where your types are VDDs, 
mm -hmm. and you sort of rule out whole variations on the fly. Mm, okay, okay. So in so practice, you get yeah. quasi-linear performance while uh -huh. exploring the exponential space. Hmm. Okay, okay. Well, yeah. Like, more looking forward to learn more, more about this. Yeah. Um, so what, what we do is to explore the search space based on a feedback function that basically encodes the two goals that we have while adding types, where one goal is to minimize the number of missing types. So ideally, we would like to add all types, but at least as many as we can while also minimizing the number of type errors, or actually we would like to have no type errors at all. And we encode this into um, a feedback score that basically sums up these two objectives um, and, 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 and weights them. And we pick the weights um, such that there's a higher weight for errors so that if you add one annotation and get one error in, in exchange, which happens very often if the annotation is wrong, um, the feedback score tells us that this is not good, that it's actually getting worse. The, there's a serious ordering issue with this approach, right? Maybe, oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe you chose to change the first argument's type and the second argument stayed the same. Um, sorry, I can actually, it's way under the table. I can do it for you. Well, actually, there's some on the wall, right? Okay. Uh, so, like, if you have two arguments that are interdependent and you have them both wrong, changing one might make you worse. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you do, how do you deal with that? Uh, currently, we don't really, so we just uh, uh, try to to add types in a in a random order, or, or to also refine or remove types. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you could you, you could have a much more clever way of, of, of doing this. Okay. Um, okay, so given the feedback score and the space, there are different strategies how you can explore the space, and um, ordering is one aspect of, of these strategies. Another one is whether you take an optimistic or pessimistic approach. So the, the pessimistic one would be to, to not add any types at all at the beginning, and then add one by one, always checking if it's actually good to do this. Whereas the optimistic one, which we chose, um, is to add the topmost predicted type everywhere, and then try to refine the annotations until you get rid of the errors. Um, there's also a greedy and a non greedy version of this, where greedy basically means if this feedback score decreases, so if things get better, we never change this type again that we've just changed. Whereas non-greedy means we sometimes backtrack to avoid getting stuck in, uh, in local medium. So for the example, um, let's have a look at these predictions again. So this is what you've seen before. So they are, um, for each type slot, there's, um, um, in this case, there are three predictions. We start with the topmost one, but this gives us uh, two type errors. So each of these red lines corresponds to one type error. Um, so we may say, okay, instead of the first prediction for color, let's try the, the second one, which removes one of the errors here. So we know that this is good. And then let's say we try the, the second also for the, uh, for the return type of this first function, which again removes one of the errors and then actually does not leave any type error, but adds the type to each type slot. So in this case, um, we, we have it. Good. So let's have a look at the evaluation. Um, so I've uh, done this work at Facebook. So um, one code corpus we considered was all the Python code that um, that, that, that exists there. Um, we also looked at a large corpus of open source Python code to be able to basically yeah, um, compare with this also, also from, a, from the researcher's um, perspective. Um, overall, these corpora give us millions of argument and return types, out of which the majority is not yet annotated. So um, there are between 6 and 12% of the types that are already annotated. Um, so there's still a lot, lot to add, but these 6 to 12% also mean that there is a lot of data to learn from, um, enough to, to actually get a better decent code. We know a few types that are, that are just trivial to predict, like for example, this type of self in Python that is sometimes annotated, but you do not really need a neural model to, 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 to find it, so we just ignore it. I mean, it's only kind of trivial, right? It's going to be an instance of the class you're currently defining, uh -huh. but it might not be that class, mm. but it could be a subclass. Well, but typically, if you write a class, then in the methods of that class, the self argument will be of the type of that class. It'll say yes to this instance, but it might not, if you ask what its class was, it might not say that class because of inheritance. True, but if people annotate 
the type of a method. Yeah. Um, they use, I mean, I think I haven't seen a case where they did not use the class itself. But, but the sub no, I, I guess, I guess, but I, I just don't know Python well enough. But like, are they, when you write that type, are you saying, is it the usual object oriented is a subclass of this thing? Or are you saying the type is equal? No, it's it, it, it's subclass. Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's have a look at the um, effectors, effectiveness of the neural model. Um, so what you see here is, um, if you only look at the top one prediction, what is the precision, the recall, and the F1 score that, that the model gives you, um, which is um, fairly good, but things get better if we also look at, at more predictions. So if you, if you not just rely on the, on the topmost prediction, but look at the top three or maybe top five, um, then, then the precision that we call um, just, just get higher. This is whether or not it appears in that list. Yes, this is whether it appears in the list, assuming that you have a magical way of finding out which right. of the top five say you need to choose, which is why we have to search to get the magical way. Yeah. Um, we also compare this to um, some baselines. So one of them is this earlier model um, uh, called NL2 type. Um, and yeah, it's uh, the typewriter model is, is, is a bit better than this. We also compare it to a very naive frequency based approach where we just suggest uh, types based on, um, on their global frequencies, which does not work very well, um, as you might expect. So just, just to back up, so for the top three, top five, this is with your search or without it? This is only the neural model. So this is this is still without the search. Yeah. Right. But the search should find it. Right. So for the search, let's let's yeah. So okay. the, the search then helps to to, to find the, the right type out of this list, not always, because it, it can only use the feedback from the from the granular type checker, but um, <coughs> at least in many cases, and we'll see how many. Um, so what you see here is if you apply the search and look maybe just at the top one or top three or top five. And then depending on what kind of search strategy we are using, um, do we find the right types? And the right types we measure in two ways. So we did this on a set of files that had been fully annotated by, by, by developers. So we take this as a ground rule. And then we either check whether the predicted types are type correct according to the type checker, or whether they exactly match the ground rule. And the reason why we have two columns here is that sometimes the type is type correct, but it's not the one that the developers have chosen because there may be two type correct ways of doing it, but the developers prefer one over the other for some reason. So let's have a look at um, the results. Um, so depending on the exact configuration, um, um, typewriter finds up to 75% of all the types in a way with, where all the types that we add are type correct. And up to 65 of all the types in a way that exactly matches what the developer wanted to interpret. If you compare this to these um, 6 to 12 percent type annotations that we had initially, it, it is a significant improvement. Uh, but of course, it does not add all the types because there's some that, yeah, for some reason, um, we just can't predict. So, I have a question. so if you're generating these likely types and then using some kind of search algorithm to Kind of find uh, uh, concordant assignment of these types. Mm -hmm. Have you considered doing some kind of an interactive approach? Like it seems like if I were a user of your tool, I might want to say, "Oh, you can run it, and maybe it gives pretty good guesses for all these." And then I'm like, "Oh, this one is clearly not an integer; it's a string," and I can specify that. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of like gradual or interactive approach that you've looked at doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So. We, we thought about it, but we, we didn't really get to, to having some interface to actually to actually do this. Um, but there definitely are cases where if you manually help a bit with one of the types, then suddenly other types become more obvious uh, and, and, and are easier to- I guess to the, the follow-up question is like, you don't have 100% accuracy. Do you output like some partial assignment and then the programmer can manually go through that and be like, oh, these are correct, I'll add them to the code and then run it again? Mm. You basically ask him, could, could you do this in an iterative way? Yeah. Um, you could. Uh, we haven't really evaluated this, but 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 you could. So so the way it's 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 presented to developers right now is that um, yeah, it basically shows the, the types that we know to be type correct, and then the developers can just say yes, I want to have all of those. Okay. okay. Yeah. How long does the inference take? Uh, the inference is pretty fast. What takes longer is the gradual effect checking, which is most. I mean, I think some of it is maybe it's, it's just engineering, yeah. um, but but there are also some some more fundamental problems. I think, um, but the inference is is is, is the fast part of it. 
from just one market. So yep. you, so just to get this correct, you do not expose the developers to like things that you think might be type mm -hmm. like might yeah. be the correct. We don't show this ranked list because that's exactly what we do not want to do. Otherwise, they would have to go through these ranked exactly. lists for every type slot. But instead, just show one type assignment that in itself is is consistent mm -hmm. and, and type right. right. Okay. Um, we also compare this to um, the static type inference that, that comes with fire, um, which is also able to, to, to find some of the types, but yeah, much fewer than um, what typewriter finds. And interestingly, almost all of the types that are found by the static type inference are subsumed by the by the neural model. Um, so yeah, I think it's fair to say that it's strictly better than, than at least this version of, of the static type inference. Um, of course, there are also some limitations. Um, one of them is this, this um, subtle difference between type correctness and soundness. So um, not all the type correct types are necessarily those that the developers really want to have. Um, another limitation is that we have this limited type vocabulary. So if there needs to be a type that is outside of this top 1000 types, then we just can't find it by design. And finally, um, as you already heated up with your question, maybe is, is the is the performance so the, the gradual type checking and because of that also the entire typewriter approach is relatively slow um which maybe can be fixed in in, in the future but right now um still remains uh, a problem good um let me just finish this up with uh with zooming out um quite a bit out of um out of these two specific approaches and getting back to this uh, general idea of neural software um, analysis and the question when to use it and maybe also when not to use it. So I'm not saying that neural software analysis should replace traditional analysis in all cases. It's just sometimes good. And we try to think a little bit about um, in what cases you, you may want to use it or not use it. And we came up with three dimensions um, where one is about the fuzziness of the information that you have in the database. So if the information is very fuzzy. For example, identifier names or, um, or or natural language information in, in comments. The neural analysis is actually a pretty good fit because it's really good about uh, at reasoning about these um, these these fuzzy pieces of information. Another dimension is whether there is a well-defined correctness criterion. So for many problems, you have a well-defined correctness criterion that tells you, okay, this is the correct solution. You just need to find it. Whereas for others, this Criterion is not available. So, for example, for name value inconsistencies, um, we just don't know, right? It's to some extent subjective. Uh, the same for, for, for type prediction, because there may be multiple types that um, are maybe type correct, but not all of them, but, but only one of them is, is what the developers actually choose. And if you do not have a well defined correctness criterion, um, then neural software analysis tends to be, uh, tends to be more useful. And then finally, the last dimension, maybe the most obvious one, it's about how much data you have collected, which you learn from. If you have a lot of examples, then yeah, neural analysis uh, makes sense. Good. And with this, I'm basically at the end of my presentation. Um, so there are, of course, some interesting open challenges. I just leave them here uh, in case you're interested. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Oh, thank you. So we definitely have time for a couple of questions. I hope also students have time in the afternoon to hang out with Michael for a bit. Yes, people see it on the schedule at 2.30, we'll hang out in here. Awesome. Um, any questions from uh, from the Zoomies? No, feeling good. This is a very quick talk. I love the visual style. It's really, it's very striking. Oh, thanks, thanks. And so, do you have do you have plans for other follow up neural analyses? Are you going to build the VS Code plugin that that uh, that's going to help platform developers? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we do. I mean, there's a lot of ongoing work um, in in this space um, we're involved in. So, so one of them is, for example, about uh, injecting bugs. Um, so. Um, I mean, if you want to train a model to find bugs, you always need a lot of bugs, and you want to have a lot of uh, realistic bugs, and and that's pretty challenging. And we yeah, we just presented something at, at FSE this year um, that tries to do this by by using these um, analogy variables um, that you can do in in, in embedding spaces. So things like uh, 
um, woman is to queen as man is to this like king, right? Um, and, and you can also do this with, with identifiers and use this to, to, to inject bugs. So that's one of the, mm -hmm. the, the lines of work we've been uh, looking at. Okay, cool. We got we had a bunch of questions in during the talk. So. Yeah, we, we had lots cool. of questions, so I think I think we're all good. Okay. Well, all right, yeah. let's take them one more time.